Book 5 Oh, who can build with poisonous breast a song worthy the majesty of these great fines? Or who in words so strong that he can frame the fit laudation for deserts of him who left us heritors of such vast prizes by his own breast discovered and sought out? There shall be none, methinks, of mortal stock, for it must need be named for him the name demanded by the now known majesty of these high matters when a god was he hear me illustrious memius a god who first and chief found out that plan of life which now is called philosophy and who by cunning craft out of such mighty waves out of such mighty darkness moored life in havens so serene light so clear prepare those old discoveries divine of others lo According to the tale, Ceres established for morta mortality the grain and botchous juice of wine born and grape, though life might yet without these things abide, even as report saith now some people live, but man's well being was impossible without a breast all free, wherefore the more that man doth justly seem to us a god from whom sweet solaces of life afar distributed it over populous domains now soothe the minds of men but if thou thinkest labors of hercules excel the same much farther from true reasoning thou fairest For what could hurt us now, that mighty maw of Nemean lion, or what the boar who bristled in Arcadia, or again, oh, what could Cretan bull or Hydra, pest of Virna, fenced with vipers venomous, or what the triple-breasted power of her the threefold Geron. The sojourners in the Stymphalian fen so dreadfully offend us were the steeds of Thracian Diomedes, breathing fire from out their nostrils off along the zones, Christonian and Dismarian, and the snake, the dread fierce gazer, guardian of the golden and gleaming apples of the Hesperides, coiled round the tree trunk with tremendous bulk. Oh, what a game could he inflict on us? Along the Atlantic shore and wastes of sea, where neither one of us approacheth nigh, nor no barbarian ventures. And the rest of all those monsters slain, even if alive, unconquered still, what injury could they do? None, as I guess. For so the glutted earth swarms even now with savage beasts, even now is filled with anxious terrors through the woods, and mighty mountains and the forest deeps. Quarters tis ours in general to avoid, but lest the breast be purged, what conflicts then? What perils must bosom in our own despite? Oh, then, how great and keen the cares of lust! that split the man distraught. How great the fears! And lo, the pride, grim greed, and wantonness, how great the slaughters in their, in their train. And lo, 
debauchery, and every breed of sloth. Therefore, that man who subjugated these, and from the mind expelled by words and deeds, not arms, or shall it not be seemly him to dignify by ranking the gods? And all the more, since he was wont to give concerning the immortal gods themselves many pronouncements with a tongue divine, and to unfold by his pronouncements all the nature of the world. And walking now in his own footprints, I do follow through his reasonings, and with pronouncements teach the covenant whereby all things are framed. Now under that covenant they must abide, or how under that covenant they must abide, actually nor ever prevail to abrogate the eons inexorable decrees k-e-o-n-s how as we found in class of mortal objects over all else the mind exists of earth-born frame create an impotent unscathed to abide Across the mighty eons, and how come in sleep those idle apparitions that so befool intelligence when we do seem to view a man whom life has left? Thus far we've gone. The order of my plan hath brought me now unto the point where I must make report how truly the universe consists of mortal body, born in time, and in what modes that congregated stuff established itself as earth and sky, ocean, and stars, and sun, and ball of moon. And then what living creatures rose from out the old telluric places, and what ones were never born at all, and in what mode the human race began to name its being, and use the varied speech from man to man, and in what mode hath bosomed in their breasts that all of gods which howleth in all lands, fanes, altars, groves, lakes, idols of the gods, also I shall untangle by what power the steersman, nature, guides the sun's courses, and the meanderings of the moon, lest we, the face, should fancy that of own free will they circle their perennial courses round, timing their motions for increase of crops and living creatures, or lest we should think they roll along by any plan of God, for even those men who have learned full well that Godheads lead a long life free of care, if yet, meanwhile, they wonder by what plan things can go on, and chiefly yon high things observed overhead on ethereal coasts, again are hurried back unto the fears of old religion, and adopt again harsh masters deemed almighty wretched men unwitting that what can be or what can be and what cannot, and by what law to each its scope prescribe, its boundary stone that cling so deep in time, but for the rest lest we delay to be here longer by empty promises behold before all else the seas the land the sky omenius their threefold nature lo their bodies three three aspects so unlike three frames so vast a single day shall give unto annihilation then shall crash that massive form and fabric of the world sustain so many eons nor do i fail to perceive how strange and marvelous this fact must strike the intellect of man 
annihilation of the sky and earth that is to be, and with what toil of words is mine to prove the same as happens oft and once ye offer to man's listening ears something before unheard of, but may not subject it to the view of eyes for him, nor put it into hand, the sight and touch, whereby the open highways of belief lead most directly into human breast and regions of intelligence. But yet I will speak out, the fact itself perchance will force belief in these my words, and thou mayest see a little time tremendously with risen commotions of, la of the lands, all things quaking to pieces, which afar from us may she, the steersman nature, guide, and may reason, oh, rather than the fact itself, persuade us that all things can be overthrown and sink with awful sounding breakage down. But before on this, I take a step to utter oracles holier and soundlier based than ever the Pythian pronounced for men out the tripod and Delphian laurel, I will unfold for thee with learned words many consolation, lest perchance, still bridled by religion, thou suppose land, sun, and sky, sea, constellations, moon must endure forever as a frame divine so conclude that it is just that those after the manner of the giants should all pay the huge penalties for monstrous crime who by their reasonings do overshake the ramparts of the universe and wish there to put out the splendid son of heaven branding with mortal talk immortal things though these same things are even so far removed from any touch of deity and seem so far unworthy of numbering with the gods that well they may be thought to furnish rather a goodly instance of the sort of things that lack the living motion living sense for sure, it is quite beside the mark to think that judgment and the nature of the mind in any kind of body can exist, just as an ether can't exist a tree, nor clouds in the salt sea, nor in the fields can fishes live, nor blood and timber be, nor sap and boulders, fixed and arranged where everything may grow and have its place. Thus nature of mind cannot arise alone without the body, nor have its being far from foods and blood. Yet if it were possible, much rather might this very power of mind be in the head, the shoulders, or the heels, and born in any part soever, Yet, in the same man, can the same vessel abide, but since within this body even of ours stands fixed and appears arranged sure where the soul and mind can each exist and grow, deny we must the more that they can endure outside the body and the breathing form in rotting clods of earth, in the sun's fire, in water, in ethers skyey coasts therefore these things no wit are furnished with sense divine since never can they be with life force quickened likewise thou canst never believe the sacred seats of gods are here in any regions of this mundane world indeed the nature of the gods so subtle so far removed from these our senses scarce may seem even by intelligence of mind and since they've ever eluded touch and thrust of human hands they cannot reach to grasp aught tangible to us for what may not itself be touched in turn can never touch wherefore besides 
Also, their seats must be unlike these seats of ours, even subtle too, as in meat for subtle essence, as I'll prove hereafter unto thee with large discourse. Further to say that for the sake of men they will to prepare this world's magnificence, and that tis therefore duty and behoof to praise the work of God's as worthy praise, and that tis sacrilege for men to shake ever by any force from out their seats what hath been established by the forethought old to everlasting for races of mankind, and that tis sacrilege to assault by words and overtopple all from base to beam. Memius, such notions to concoct and pile is verily to dote our gratefulness. Oh, what a moment could it confer upon immortals and upon the blessed that they should take a step to manage aught for the sake of us? Or what new factor could after so long a time, inveigable, inveigable, them, the hitherto reposeful desire to change their former life, but rather he whom old things chafe seems likely to rejoice at new, but one that in fore past time hath chanced upon no ill through goodly years. Oh, what could ever enkindle in such an one passion for strange experiments? Or what is evil for us if we had never been born? As though forsooth in darkling realm and woe our life were lying till it should dawn at last the day spring of creation. Whosoever hath been begotten wills perforce to stay in life so long as fond delight detains, but whoso never hath tasted love of life, and never was in count of living things, what hurts in him that he was never born? Went further, first was planted in the gods the archetype for gendering the world, and the fore notion of what man is like, so that they knew and preconceived with mind just what they wished to make. For how were known ever the energies of primal germs, and what those germs by interchange of place could thus produce, in na if nature's self had not given example for creating all? For in such wise primordials of things, many in many modes, Disturb our blows from immemorial, immemorial eons in motion too, by their own weight, have evermore been wont to be so borne along and in all modes to meet together and to try all sorts, which by combining one with other they are powerful to create, that thus it is no marvel now if they have also fallen into arrangements such and if they've passed into vibrations such as whose, as those whereby this sum of things is carried on today by fixed renewal. But knew I never what the seeds primordial were, yet would I dare this to affirm even from deep judgments based upon the ways and conduct of the skies, this to maintain by many a fact besides that in no wise the nature of all things for us was fashioned by a power divine so great the faults it stands encumbered with first mark all regions which are overarched by the prodigious reaches of the sky one yawning part thereof the mountain chains and forest of the beasts do have and hold, and cliffs and desert fens and wastes of sea, which sunder afar the 
beaches of the land possess it merely, and again thereof well nigh two thirds intolerable heat and a perpetual fall of frost doth rob from mortal kind, and what is left to till, even that the force of nature would overturn if brambles did not human force oppose, long want for livelihood to groan and sweat over the two-pronged mattock and to cleave the soil in twain by pressing on the plow, unless by the plowshare turning the fruitful clods and kneading the mold requicken into birth, the crop spontaneously could not come up into the free bright air. Even then sometimes, when things acquired by the sternest toil are now in leaf, are now in blossom all, either the skyey sun with baneful heats parches or sudden rains or chilling rime destroys or flaws of winds with furious whirl torment and twist beside these matters why doth nature feed and foster on land and sea the dreadful breed of savage beasts the foes of the human clan why do the seasons bring distempers with them wherefore stalks at large death so untimely then again the babe like to the castaway of the raging surf lies naked on the ground speechless in want of every help for life when nature first hath poured him forth upon the shores of light with birth pangs from within the mother's womb and with the plaintive wail he fills the place as well befitting one for whom remains in life a journey through so many ills for all the flocks and herds and all wild beasts come forth and grow nor need the little rattles nor must be treated to the humoring nurses dear broken chatter nor seek they diverse clothes to suit the changing skies nor need and fine, nor arms, nor lofty ramparts, wherewithal their own to guard, because the earth herself and nature, artificer of the world, bring forth aboundingly all things for all. And first, since body of earth and water, air like breath, and fiery exhalations, of which for this sum of things is seen to be compact. So all have birth and perishable frame, thus the whole nature of the world itself must be conceived as perishable too. For verily, those things of which we see the parts and members to have birth and time and perishable shapes, those same we mark to be invariably born in time and born to die. And therefore, when I see the mightiest members and the parts of this our world consumed and be God again, it is mine to know that also sky above and earth beneath began of old in time and shall in time go under to disaster. And lest in these affairs thou deemest me to have seized upon this point by slight to serve my own caprice, because I have assumed that earth and fire are mortal things indeed, and have not doubted water and the air both perish too, and have affirmed the same to be again begotten and wax big, Mark well the argument in the first place, lo, some certain parts of earth grievously parched by unremitting suns and trampled on by a vast throng of feet exhale abroad a powdery haze and flying clouds of dust, which the stout winds disperse in the whole air. Part, moreover, of her sod and soil is summoned to inundation by the rains and rivers praise and gouge the banks away. Besides, whatever takes a part its own in fostering and increasing aught is rendered back and since beyond a doubt earth, the all-mother, 
is beheld to be likewise the common sepulture of things. Therefore thou seest her diminished of her plenty, and then again augmented with new growth. And for the rest, that sea, that end stream and springs forever with new waters overflow, and that perennially the fluid's well needeth no words. The mighty flux itself of multitudinous waters round about declareth this. But whatso water first streams up is ever straightway carried off, and thus it comes to pass that. All in all, there is no overflow, in part because the burly winds that oversweep a main and skyey sun that with his rays dissolves do diminish the level sea, in part because the water is diffused underground through all the land, the brine is filtered off and then the liquid stuff seeps back again and all regathers at the river heads whence the fresh water currents on it blows over the lands or down the channels which were cleft erstwhile and erstwhile bore along the liquid footed floods now then of air i'll speak which hour by hour in all its body is changed innumerably but whatsoever streams up in dust or vapor off of things, the same is all and always borne along into the mighty ocean of the air. And did not air in turn restore to things bodies and thus recruit them as they stream, all things by this time had resolved then and changed into air. Therefore, it never ceases to be engendered off of things and to return to things, since verily in constant flux do all things stream. Likewise, the abounding wellspring of the liquid light, the eternal, ethereal, sorry, the ethereal sun, the flood, the heaven over, with constant flux or radiance ever new and with fresh light supplies the place of light upon the instant. For whatever effulgence hath first streamed off, no matter where it falls, is lost unto the sun, and this tis thine to know from these examples. Soon as clouds have first begun to underpass the sun, and as it were to rend the rays of light in twain, at once the lower part of them is lost entire and earth is overcast wherever the thunderheads are rolled along so know thou mayest that things forever need a fresh replenishment of gleam and glow and each effulgence foremost flash forth perish one by one lest happily thou shouldst think they endure and reviable Again, perceivest not how stones are also conquered by time? Not how the lofty towers ruin down and boulders crumble? Not how shrines of gods and idols crack outworn? Nor how indeed the holy influence hath yet no power there to postpone the terminals of fate? or headway make against nature's fixed degrees trees again behold we not the monuments <clears throat> of heroes now in ruins asking us in their turn likewise if we don't believe they also age with eld behold we not the rendered the salt ruining a main down from the lofty mountains, powerless to endure and dree the mighty forces there of finite time, for they would never fall rendered as sudden, if from infinite past they had prevailed against all injuries of the assaulting eons with no crash. Again, 
Now look at this which round above contains the whole earth in its one embrace, and from itself it procreates all things, as some men tell, and takes them to itself once, once destroyed. Entirely must it be of mortal birth and body, for whatever from out itself giveth to other things increase and food, the same perforce must be diminished, and then recruited when it takes things back into itself. Besides all this, if there had been no origin in birth of lands and sky, and they had ever been the everlasting why, before even war and obsequies of Troy, have other bards not also chanted other high affairs? Whither have sunk so often so many deeds of heroes? Why do those deeds live no more, engrafted in eternal monuments of glory? Verily, I guess, because the sum is new and of a recent date, the nature of our universe, and had not long ago its own exordium. Wherefore, even now some arts are still being still refined, still increased. Now unto ships is being added many a new device. And but the other day musician folk gave birth to melic sounds of organing. And then this nature, this account of things, hath been discovered latterly, and I myself have been discovered only now, as first among the first able to turn the same into ancestral Roman speech. Yet if per case thou deemest that before this existed all things even the same, but that perished the cycles of the human race in fiery exaltations, exhalations, or cities fell by some tremendous quaking of the world, or rivers in fury after constant rains, had plunged forth across the lands of earth and whelmed the towns, then all the more must thou confess defeated by the argument that there shall be annihilation too of lands and sky. For at a time when things were being taxed by maladies so great and so great perils, if some cause more fell had then assailed them far and wide, they would have gone to disaster and supreme collapse. And by no other reasoning are we seen to be mortal, save that all of us sicken in turn with those same maladies with which have sickened in the past those men whom nature hath removed from life. Again, whatever abides eternal must indeed either repel all strokes, because tis made of solid body, and permit no entrance of aught with power to sunder from within the parts compact, as are those seeds of stuff whose nature we exhibited before, or else be able to endure through time for this, because they are from blows exempt, as is the void, the which abides untouched, unsmit, by any stroke or else because there is no room around where two things can as for the part in dissolution all even as the sum of sums eternal is without a place beyond where two things may asunder fly or bodies which can smite and thus dissolve them by the blows of might but not of solid body, as I've shown, exists the nature of the world, because in things tis intermingled there a void. Nor is the world yet as the void, nor are, moreover, bodies lacking which, per case, rising from out the infinite, can fell with fury whirlwinds all this sum of things, or bring upon them other cataclysm of peril strange, and yonder, too, 
by the infinite space and the profound abyss wherein to lull the ramparts of the world can yet be shivered for some other power can pound upon them till they perish all thus is the door of doom a no wise barred against the sky against the sun and earth and deep sea waters but wide open stands and gloats upon them monstrous and agape wherefore again it is needful to confess that these same things are born in time for things which are of mortal body could indeed never from infinite past until the day have spurned the multitudinous assaults of the immeasurable eons old again since battle so fiercely won with other and uh, with other <clears throat> the four most mighty members of the world rouse in an all unholy war one by the way is o n e see is not that there may be for them an end of the long strife or when the skyey sun and all the heat waves won dominion over the sucked up waters all and this they try still to accomplish though as yet they fail for so aboundingly the streams supply a new store of waters that tis rather they who menace the world with inundations vast from forth the unplumbed chasms of the sea but vain since winds that oversweep amain and skyey sun that with his rays dissolves do diminish the level seas and trust their power to dry up all before the waters can arrive the end of their endeavouring breeding such vasty warfare they contend in balanced strife the one with other still concerning mighty issues though indeed the fire was once the more victorious and once as goes the tale the water won a kingdom in the fields for fire overmastered and licked up many things and burnt away what time the impetuous horses of the sun snatched Phaeton headlong from his skyey road down the whole ether and over all the lands. But the omnipotent father is in keen wrath then with the sudden smite of thunderbolt did hurl the mighty minded hero off those horses to the earth. And Saul, his sire, meeting him as he fell, caught up in hand the ever blazing lampion of the world and drave together the pell-mell horses there and yoked them all a tremble and a main steering them over along their own old road restored the cosmos as forsooth we hear from songs of ancient poets of the greeks a tale too far away from truth meseems for fire can win when from the infinite has risen a larger throng of particles of fiery stuff and then its powers succumb somehow subdued again or else at last it shrivels and toward atmospheres the world and willem water too began to win as goes the story when it overwhelmed the lives of men with billows, and thereafter when all that force of water stuff which forth from out the infinite had risen up did now retire, and somehow turned aside, the rainstorm stopped, and streams their fury checked. Then what modes that conflux of first stuff did found the multitudinous universe of earth and sky and the unfathomed deeps of ocean and courses of the sun and moon all now in order tell for of a truth neither by 
council did, the primal germs established themselves as my keen active mind, each in its proper place. Nor did they make, forsooth, a compact how each germ should move below, because primordials of things many and many modes to stir by blows from familial eons in motion too by their own weights have evermore been wont to be so borne along and in all modes to meet together and to try all sorts which by combining one with other they are powerful to create because of this it comes to pass that those primordials diffused far and wide through mighty eons and while they unisons try emotions too of every kind meet at the last amain and so become off the commencements fit of mighty things earth sea and sky and race of living creatures and that long ago the wheel of the sun could nowhere be discerned flying far up with its abounding blaze nor constellations of the mighty world, nor ocean, nor heaven, nor even earth, nor air, but aught of things like unto things of ours could then be seen, but only some strange storm and a prodigious hurly burly mass, compounded of all kinds of primal germs, whose battling discords and disorder kept interstices and paths coherencies and weights and blows and counterings and motions because by reason of their forms unlike and varied shape they could not all thus wise remain conjoined nor harmoniously have interplay of movements but from their portions began to fly asunder and like with like to join and to block out a world and to divide its members and dispose its mightier parts that is to set secure the lofty heavens from the land and cause the sea to spread with waters separate and fires of ether separate and separate and pure, likewise to congregate apart. First came together. For lo, first came together the earthly particles, as being heavy and intertangled there in the mid region, and all began to take the lowest abodes, and ever the more they got one with another intertangled, the more they pressed from out their mass those particles which were to form the sea, the stars, the sun, and moon, and ramparts of the mighty world, for these consist of seeds more smooth and round, and of much smaller elements than earth, and thus it was that ether fraught with fire first broke away from out the earth and parts through the innumerable pores of earth and raise itself aloft and with itself bore lightly off the many starry fires and not far otherwise we often see and the still lakes and the perennial streams exhale a mist and even as earth herself is seen at times to smoke when first at dawn the light of the sun, the many rayed, begins to redden into gold over the grass, the gemmed with dew, and all of these are brought together overhead, the clouds on high, with now concreted body weave a cover beneath the heavens, and thus wise ether too, light and Fusive, concreted body on all sides spread, on all sides bent itself into a dome, and far and wide diffused 
on unto every region on all sides, thus hedged all else within its greedy clasp. Hard upon ether came the origins of sun and moon, whose globes revolve in air, midway between the earth and mightiest ether, for neither took them, since they weighed too little to sink and settle, but too much to glide along to the utmost shores, and yet they are in such a wise midway between twain as ever to whirl their living bodies around, and ever to endure as parts of the wide whole, in the same fashion as certain members may in us remain at rest while others move, and then these substances had been withdrawn amain the earth, where now extend the vast cerulean zones of all the level seas, caved in and down along the hollows poured the whirlpools of her brine, and day by day the more the tides of ether and rays of sun on every side constrained into one mass the earth by lashing it again and again upon its outer edges, so that then, being thus beat down till it's all condensed about its proper center, ever the more the salty sweat for out its body squeezed augmented ocean and the fields of foam by seeping through its frame and all the more those many particles of heat and air escaping began to fly aloft and form by condensation there afar from earth the high refulgent circuits of the heavens planes began to sink and windy slopes of the high mountains to increase for rocks could not subside nor all the parts of ground settle alike to one same level. Thus, then, the massy weight of earth stood firm, with now concreted body, when, as for all the slime of the world heavy and gross had run together and settled at the bottom, like lees or bilge, then ocean, then the air, then ether herself, the fraught with fire, were all left with their liquid bodies pure and free, and each more lighter than the next below, and ether most light and liquid of the three floats on above the long ethereal winds, nor with the brawling of the winds of air mingles its liquid body, doth leave all there, those under realms below her heights there to be overset in whirlwinds wild, doth leave all there to brawl in wayward gusts, whilst gliding with the fixed impulse still, itself it bears its fires along, for lo, that ether can flow thus steadily on, on, with one unaltered urge, the pontus proves that sea which floweth forth with fixed tides, keeping one onward tenor as it glides, and that the earth may there abide at rest in the mid-region of the world it needs must vanish bit by bit and wait and lessen and have another substance underneath, conjoined to it from its earliest age and linked unison with the vasty world realm of the air in which it roots and lives. On this account the earth is not a load nor presses down on wings of air beneath, even as unto a man his members be without all weight. The head is not a load unto the neck, nor do we feel the whole weight of the body the center in the feet. But what so weights come on us from without, weights laid upon us, these harass and chafe, though off far lighter, for to such degree it matters always what the innate powers of any given thing may be. The earth was then no alien substance fetched amain, and from no alien firmament cast down on alien air, but was conceived like air in the first origin of this the world, as a fixed portion of the same, as now our members are seen to be part of us. 
sides the earth when of a sudden shock by the big thunder doth with her motion shake all that's above her which she never could do by any means were earth not bounding fast unto the great world's realms of air and sky for they cohere together with common roots and join both even from their earliest age in unison i seest thou not that this most subtle energy of soul supports our body though so heavy a weight because indeed is with it so conjoined in unison what power in some can raise with agile leap a body aloft save energy of mind which steers the limbs now seest thou not how powerful may be a subtle nature when conjoined it is with heavy body as air is with the earth conjoined the energy of mind with us now let us see what makes the stars to move in the first place if the mighty sphere of heaven revolveth round then needs we must aver that on the upper and the under pole presses a certain air and from without confines them and encloseth at each end and that moreover another air above streams on a fort top of the sphere and tends in the same direction as our rolling rolled along the glittering stars of the eternal world for that another still streams on below to whirl the sphere from under up and on in opposite direction as we see the rivers turn the wheels and water scoop it may be also that the heavens do all remain at rest whilst yet are borne along the lucid constellations either because swift tides of ether are by a sky enclosed and whirl round seeking a passage out and everywhere make roll the starry fires through some main regions of the sky or else because some air streaming along from an eternal quarter off beyond whirleth the driven fires or then because the fires themselves have power to creep along going wherever their food invites and calls and feeding their flaming bodies everywhere throughout the sky yet which of these is caused in this our world it is hard to say for sure but what can be throughout the universe in diverse worlds on diverse plan create this only do i show and follow on to assign unto the motions of the stars even several causes which it is possible exist throughout the universal all of which yet one must be the cause even here which maketh motion or constellation yet to decide which one of them it be is not the least the business of a man advancing step by cautious step as I, nor can the sun's wheel larger be by much, nor its own blaze much less than either seems unto our senses. For from what so spaces fires have the power on earth to cast their beams and blow their scorching exhalations forth against our members, those same distances take nothing by those intervals away from bulk of flame into the sight the fire is nothing shrunken therefore since the heat and outpoured light of skyey sun arrive our senses and caress our limbs form to and bigness of the sun must look even here from earth just as they really be so that thou canst scarce nothing take or add and whether the journeying moon illuminate the regions round with Fast her beams or throw from off her proper body her own light, whichever it be, the journeys with a form not larger than the form doth seem to be, which we with eyes 
of ours perceive all the far removed objects of our gaze seem too much air confused in that look for diminished in their bigness wherefore moon seems she presents bright look and clear cut form nay there on high by us on earth be seen just as she is with extreme bounds defined and just of the size and lastly whatso fires of ether thou from earth beholdest these thou mayest consider as possibly of size the least bit less or larger by a hair than they appear since whatso fires we view here in the lands of Ur are seen to change from time to time their size to less or more only the least and more or less away so long as still they bicker clear and still their glows proceed nor need there be from them astonishment that yonder sun so small can yet send forth so great a light as fills oceans and all the lands in the sky a flood and with its fiery exhalations steeps the world at large for it may be indeed that one vast flowing wellspring of the whole wide world from here hath opened and out gushed and shot its light abroad because thus wise the elements of fiery exhalation from all the world around together come and thus wise flow into a bulk so big that from one single fountainhead may stream this heat and light and seest thou not indeed how widely one small water spring may wet the meadow lands at times and flood the fields it is even possible besides that heat from forth the sun's own fire albeit that fire be not of great may permeate the air with the fierce hot if but perchance the air be conditioned so tempered then as to be kindled even when beat upon only by a little particles of heat just as we sometimes see the standing grain or stubble straw and conflagration all from one lone spark and possibly the sun the gleam on high with rosy lampion possesses about him with invisible heats of plenteous fire by no effulgence mark so that he marketh he that fraught with fire increased to such degree the force of rays nor is there one sure cause revealed to men how the sun journeys from his summer haunts on to the midmost winter turning points of Capricorn and then reverting veers back to the solstice bowls of Cancer nor how tis the moon is seen each month across that very distance which in traversing the sun consumes the measure of the year I say no clear reason hath been given for these affairs, yet chief in likelihood seemeth the doctrine which the holy thought of the great Democritus lays down, that ever the nearer the constellations be to earth, the less can they, by whirling of the sky, be borne along, because the skyey powers which do the loft do vanish and decree an under region, and the sun is thus left by degrees behind amongst those signs that follow after since the sun he lies far down below the starry nights that blaze and the moon lag even tardier than the sun and just so far as is her force removed from upper heaven and nigh unto the lands and just so far she fails to keep the pace with starry signs above for just so far as feeble is, is the world that bears on her, being indeed still lower than the sun, and just so far do all the starry signs circling around overtake her overpass.
Therefore, it happens that the moon appears more swiftly to return to any sign along the zodiac than does the sun, because those signs do visit her again more swiftly than they visit the great sun. It can, uh, it can be also that two streams of air alternately at fixed periods blow out from transverse regions of the world of which the one may thrust the sun away from summer signs to midmost winter cold and rigorous of the cold and the other then may cast him back from icy shades of chill even to the heat fraught regions and the signs that blaze along the zodiac. So too we must suppose the moon and all the stars which through the mighty and sidereal years roll round in mighty orbits may be sped by streams of air from regions alternate. Seest thou not also how the clouds be sped by contrary winds to regions contrary? the lower clouds diversely from the upper, then why may yonder stars and ether there along their mighty orbits not be borne by currents opposite the one to other? But night overwhelms the land with vastly murk either when sun after his diurnal course hath walked the ultimate regions of the sky and really hath Panted forth his fires, shivered by their long journeying and wasting, by traversing multitudinous air, or else because of the selfsame force that drave his orb along above the lands compels him then to turn his course beneath the lands. Matuta also at a fixed hour spreadeth the roseate day morning out along the coasts of heaven and deploys the light either because the self same sun returning under the lands aspires to seize the sky striving to set it blazing with his rays for he himself appear or else because fires then will congregate in many seeds of heat are wont even at a fixed time to spring together, gendering evermore new suns and light. Just so the story goes that from the Indian mountain tops are seen dispersed fires upon the break of day which thence combine at twitter into one ball and form an orb, nor yet in these affairs is aught for wonder that these seeds of fire can thus together stream at times so fixed and shape anew the splendor of the sun. For many facts we see which come to pass at fixed time in all things. Virgin shrub at fixed time, and at a fixed time they cast their flowers, and eld commands the teeth at time as surely fixed to drop away, and youth commands the growing boy to bloom with the soft down and let from both his cheeks the soft beard fall, and lastly thunderbolts, snow, rain, clouds, winds, at seasons of the year, no wise unfixed, all do come to pass. For where even from their old primordial start causes have ever worked in such a way, and where even from the world's first origin thuswise have things befallen, so even now after a fixed order they come round in sequence also. Likewise days may wax whilst the nights wane, and daylight diminished be whilst nights do take their augmentation, either because the self-same sun coursing under the lands and over 
into arcs, a longer and a briefer, thus the spark coasts of either and divides in twain his orbit all unequally, and adds as round he's born unto the one half there as much as from the other half he's taken. And so he then arrives that sign of heaven where the year's node renders the shades of night equal unto the periods of light. For when the sun is midway on his course between the blast of north wind and of south, heaven keeps his two goals parted equally by virtue of the fixed position old of the whole starry zodiac through which that sun in winding onward takes a year, illumining the sky and all the lands. The bleak light his men declare to us who by their diagrams have charted well those regions of the sky which we adorn with the arranged signs of zodiac, or else because in certain parts the air under the lands is denser. The Tremulous bright beams of fire do waver tardily, nor easily can penetrate that air, nor yet emerge unto their rising place. For this it is that nights in winter time do linger long before comes the many rayed brown badge of the day, or else because, as said in alternating seasons of the year, Fire is now more quick and now more slow are wont to stream together. The fires which make the sun to rise in some one spot, therefore, it is that those men seem to speak the truth who hold a new sun is with each new daybreak born. The moon, she possibly doth shine because struck by the rays of sun and day by day may turn unto our gaze her light, the more she doth recede from orb of sun until facing him opposite across the world, she hath with full effulgence gleaming abroad and at her rising as she soars above, hath there observed his setting. Thence likewise she needs must hide, as for her light behind by slow degrees, the nearer now she glides along the circle of the zodiac. From her far place toward fire the younger sun of those men hold who feign the moon to be just like a ball and to pursue a course betwixt the sun and earth. There is again some reason to suppose that moon may roll with light her very own and thus display the very shapes of her splendors there. The near her is per case another body, invisible because devoid of light, borne on and gliding all along with her, which in three modes may block and blot her disk. Again she may revolve upon herself like to a ball of spheres. If perchance that be one half of her died over with glowing light, and by the revolution of that sphere she may beget for us her varying shapes until she turns that fiery part of her full to the sight and open eyes of men. Thence by slow stages round and back she whirls, withdrawing thus the inesperous part of her sphered mass and ball as early the Babylonian doctrine of Chaldees, refuting the art of Greek astrologers, labors in opposition to prove sure, as if, forsooth, the thing for which each fights might not alike be true, or aught there were, there wherefore thou mightest risk embracing one more than the other notion, then again, why a new moon might not forevermore created be with fixed successions there of shapes and with configurations fixed 
and why each day that bright created moon might not miscarry another bee in its stead and place engender new. It's hard to show by reason or by words to prove absurd, since, lo, so many things can be created with big successions. Springtime and Venus come, and Venus is void. The winged harbinger steps on before and hard on Zephyr's footprints, Mother Flora, sprinkling the ways before them, filleth all with colors and with odors excellent, for after follows arid heat, and he companion leads by the series dusty one, and by the Asian breezes of the north, then cometh autumn on, and with him steps Lord Bacchus, and then other seasons too, and other winds do follow the high roar of great Volturnus, and the south wind strong with thunderbolts. At last earth's first day bears on to men the snows, and brings again the numbing cold. And winter follows her, his teeth with chills a chatter. Therefore it is the less a marvel if at fixed time a moon is thus begotten and again at fixed time destroyed. Since things so many can come to being thus at fixed time. Likewise the sun eclipses and the moon's far occultations Rightly thou mayest deem as due to several causes. For indeed, why should the moon be able to shut out earth from the light of the sun, and on the side the earthward thrust her high head under sun, supposing dark orb to his glowing beams, and yet at the same time one supposed the effect could not result from some one other body which glides the void of light forevermore. Again, why could not sun in weakened state at fixed time for lose his fibers, and then, when he has passed on along the air beyond the regions, hostile to his flames that quench and kill his fires, why could not he renew his light? And why should earth in turn have power to rob the moon of light and bear himself on high? Keep the sun hid beneath, whilst the moon glideth in her monthly course, and through the rigid shadows of the cone. And yet, at the same time, some one other body does not have the power to underpass the moon, or glide along above the orb of sun, breaking his rays and outspread light asunder. And still, this moon herself refulgent be with her own sheen. Why could she not at times in some one quarter of the mighty world grow weak and weary while she passes through regions unfriendly to the beings her own? And now to what remains. Since I resolve by what arrangements all things come to pass through the three regions of the mighty world, how we can know what energy and cause started the various courses of the sun and the moon's goings, and by what far means they can succumb, the while with thwarted light and veil with shade the unsuspecting lands, when, as it were, they blink, and then again with open eye survey all regions wide resplendent with white radiance i do not i do now return unto the world's primeval age and tell what first the soft young fields of earth with earliest or tertian had decreed to raise in air into the shores of light and to entrust unto the wayward winds in the beginning, earth gave forth around the hills and over all the length 
parts of plains and races of grasses and shining green. The flowery meadows sparkled all aglow with greening color, and thereafter lo unto the diverse kinds of trees was given an emulous impulse mighty mightily to shoot with a free rein aloft into the air as feathers and hairs and bristles are begot the first on members of the four foot three and on the bodies of the strong wing thus then the new earth first of all put forth grasses and shrubs and afterward begat the mortal generations there upsprung innumerable in those innumerable after diverging fashions for from the sky these breeding creatures never can have dropped nor the land dwellers ever have come up out of sea pools of salt how truly man's how marriage is that adopted name of earth the mother since from out the earth are all begotten and even now arise from out the loneliness how many living things concreted by the rains and heat of the sun wherefore it is less a marvel if they sprang and long ago more many and more big matured of those days in the fresh young years of earth and ether first of all the race of the winged ones and hardy colored birds hatched out in the springtime left their eggs behind as nowadays in summer tree crickets do leave their shiny husks of one accord seeking their food and living then it was this earth of thine first gave unto the day the mortal generations for prevailed among the fields abounding hot and wet and hence where any fitting spot was given there then grow wing cavities by roots affixed to earth and when in ripened time the age of the young was in that sought the air and fled earth's damps that birth these wings oh then the nature thither turn the pores of earth and make her spurt from open veins of juice like unto milk even as a woman now is filled at childbearing with the sweet milk because all that swift stream of ailment is thither turned unto the mother breast there earth was furnished with the children food warmth was their swallowing cloth their grass their bed abounding in soft down earth's newness then would rouse no dour spells of the bitter cold nor extreme heats nor winds of mighty powers for all things grow and gather strength through time in like proportion and then earth was young wherefore again again how Mary is that adopted name of earth the mother since she herself begot the human race and at one well nigh fixed time brought forth each beast that ranges raving round about upon the mighty mountains and all birds aerial with many a rude shape but lo because her bearing years must end she ceased like to a woman worn by elves for bats and aeons change the nature of the whole wide world and all things needs must take one status after other nor aught persists forever like itself all things depart nature she changes all compelleth all to transformation lo this moulders down a slack with weary eld and that again prospers in glory issuing from contempt in such wise then the lapsing eons change the nature of the whole wide world and earth taketh one status after other 
And what she bore of old she now can bear no longer, and what she never bore she can today. In those days also the telluric world strove to beget the monsters that upsprung with their astounding visages and limbs, the man-woman, the thing betwixt the twain, yet neither, and from either sex remote, some gruesome boggles, orphaned of the feet, some withered of the hands, some horrors too without a mouth, or blind ones of no eye, or bulks all shackled by their legs and arms, cleaving unto the body fore and aft. Thus wise that never could they do or go, nor shun disaster, nor take the good they would, and other prodigies and monsters, earth was then the getting of this sort in vain. Since nature damned with horror their increase, and powerless were they to reach unto the coveted flower of fair maturity, or to find ailment, or to interwine in works of Venus. For we see there must concur in life conditions manifold, if life is ever by begetting life before the generations one by one. First foods must be, and next a path whereby the seeds of impregnation in the frame may ooze, released from the members all. Last, possession of those instruments whereby the male with female can unite, the one with other in mutual ravishments. And in the ages after monsters died, perforce there perished many a stock unable by propagation to forge or progeny. For whatsoever creatures thou beholdest breathing the breath of life, the same have been even from their earliest age, preserved alive by cunning or by valor, or at least by the speed of foot or wing. And many a stock remaineth yet because of use to man, and so committed to man's guardianship. Valor hath saved alive fierce lion breeds, and many another terrorizing race. Cunning the fox, white the antlered stag, light sleeping dogs with faithful heart and breast. However, an every kind begot can see a beast of draught, as to the woolly flock the horned cattle all Parmenius have been committed to guardianship of men. For anxiously they fled the savage beasts, and peace they sought, and their abundant foods obtained with never labors of their own, which we secure to them as fit rewards for their good service. But those beasts to whom nature has granted not of these same things Beasts quite unfit for our own free will to thrive, and fain for any service unto us, and thanks for which we should permit their kind to feed and be in our protection safe. Those of a truth were wont to be exposed, and shackled in the gruesome bonds of being, as prey and booty for the rest until nature reduced that stock to utter death. But centaurs never have been, nor can there be creatures of twofold stock and double frame, compact of members alien in kind, yet formed with equal function, equal force in every bodily part. Fact, thou mayest, however dull thy wits, well learn from this, the horse, when his three years have rolled away, flowers in his prime of vigor, but the boy not so, for oft even then he gropes in sleep after the milky nibbles of the breast, an infant still, and later, when at last the lusty powers of horses and stout limbs, now weak through lapsing life, do fail with age. Lo, only then doth youth with flowering years begin the boys, and clothe their ruddy cheeks with the soft down. So never deem, Percase, that 
from a man and from the seed of horse, the beast of draft, and centaur decomposed, forever exist alive. Marcellus be half fish body girl with mad dogs, nor others of this sort in whom they mark members discordant each with each for never at one same time they reach the flower of age or gain and lose full vigor of their frame and never burn with one same lust of love and never in their habits they agree nor find the same foods equally delightsome sooth as one oft may see the bearded goats batten upon the hemlock which to man is violent poison once again since flame is wont to scorch and burn the tawny bulks of the great lions as much as other kinds of flesh and blood existing in the lands how could it be that she mare alone the triple body for a lion she and aft a dragon and betwixt a goat might at the mouth from out the body belch in fury at flame wherefore the man who feigns such beings could have been engendered when earth was new and the young sky was fresh basing his empty argument on me may babble with like reason many whims into our ears but say perhaps that then rivers of gold through every landscape flowed that trees were wont with precious stones to flower or that in those far eons man was born with such gigantic length and lift of limbs as to be able based upon his feet deep oceans to bestride or with his hands to whirl the firmament around his head for though in earth were many seeds of things in the old time when this telluric world first poured the breeds of animals abroad still that is nothing of a sign that then such hybrid creatures could have been begot and limbs of all beasts heterogeneous have been together knit because indeed the diverse kinds of grasses and grains and delights and trees which even now spring up abounding from within the earth and still never be begotten with their stems be grafted into one but each soul thing proceeds according to its proper want, and all can serve their own distinctions based in nature's fixed degree. Fit. But mortal man was then far hardier in the old champion, champagne, as well he should be, since a hardier earth had him begotten. Builded too was he of bigger and more solid bones within, and knit with stalwart sinews through the flesh, nor easily seized by either heat or cold, or alien food, or any ale or irk. And while so many lustrums of the sun rolled on across the sky, men led a life after the roving habit of wild beasts. Not then were sturdy guiders of curved plows, and none knew then to work the fields with iron, or plant young shoots in holes of delved loam, or lot with hook knives off high trees, the boughs of yesteryear. What sun and rains with them had given, for earth of own accord created them, was boon enough to glad their simple hearts made acorn laden oaks would they relish their bodies for the knots and the wild berries of the arbut tree which now thou seest to ripen purple red in winter time the old telluric soul would bear them more abundant and more big and many coarse foods too and long ago 
blooming freshness of the rank young world produced enough for the poor wretches there, and rivers and springs would summon them of old to slake the thirst. As now from the great hills the water's downrush calls aloud and far the thirsty generations of the wild, so too they sought the grottoes of the nymphs, the woodland haunts discovered as they ranged from forth of which they knew that gliding rills with gush and splash abounding laved the rocks, the dripping rocks, and trickled from above over the verdant moss, and here and there welled up and burst across the open flats. As yet they knew not to enkindle fire against the cold, nor hairy pelts to use and clothe their bodies with the spoils of beasts. While huddled in groves, the mountain caves and woods amongst the thickets hid their squalid backs when driven to flee the lashings of the winds and the big rains, nor could they then regard the general good, nor did they know to use in common any customs, any laws, whatever of booty fortune unto each had proffered, each alone would bear away, by instinct trained for self to thrive and live, and beings in the forest then would link the lovers' bodies, for the woman yielded either from mutual flame or from the man's impetuous fury and insatiate lust, or from a bribe, his acorn nuts, choice pears, or the wild berries of the arbut tree, and thrusting wondrous strength of hands and legs, they chased the forest wanderers, the beasts, and many they conquer, but some few they fled, a skulk into their hiding places. With the flung stones and with the ponderous heft of the gnarled branch, and by the time of night overtaken, they would throw, like bristly boars, their wild men's limbs naked upon the earth, rolling themselves in leaves and fronded boughs. Nor would they call the late lamentations loud around the fields for daylight and the sun, quaking and wandering in the shadows of the night, but silent and buried in the sleep, they'd wait until the sun with rosy flambeau brought the glory to the sky. From childhood want ever to see the dark and day begot in times alternate, never might they be bewildered by wild misgiving, lest the night eternal should possess the land with light of the sun withdrawn forever. But their care was rather that the clans of savage beasts would often make their sleep time horrible for those poor wretches, and from home be driven. They'd flee their rocky shelters at approach of boar, the spummy lipped or lion strong, and in the midnight yield with terror up to those fierce guests their beds of outspread beads. And yet in those days not much more than now with generations of mortality leave the sweet light of fading life behind and deep in those days here and there a man more often snatched upon and gulped by fame afforded the beast the food that roared alive echoing through groves and hills and forest trees, even as he viewed his living flesh entombed within a living grave, whilst those whom flight had saved with bone and body bitten shrieked, pressing their quivering palms to loathsome sores with horrible voices for eternal death, until forlorn of help and witless what might medicine their wounds the writing pains took from them life.
but not in those far times would one lone day give over unto doom with soldiery and columns marching on beneath the battle banners nor would then the ramping breakers of the main seas dash whole argos seas and cruise upon the rocks but ocean uprisen would often rave in vain without all end or outcome and give up his empty menacings as lightly too nor soft seductions of a serene sea to lure by laughing billows any man out to disaster for the science bold of ship sailing lay dark in those far times again was then that lack of food gave over men's fainting limbs to this illusion now this plenty overwhelms i'm wary they oft for themselves themselves would then outpour the poison now with nicer art themselves they give the draughts to others afterwards when huts they had procured and pelts and fire and when the woman joining to the man withdrew with him into one dwelling place were known and when they saw and often born from out themselves when first the human race began to soften for it was now that fire rendered their shivering frames less staunch to bear under the canopy of sky the cold and love reduced their shaggy hardiness and children with the prattle and the kiss soon broke the parents haughty temper down then too did neighbors gin to league as friends eager to wrong no more or suffer wrong and urge for children and the womankind mercy the fathers love with cries and gestures they stammered hints how meet it was with all should have compassion on the weak and still though concord not in every wise could then be gotten be a good a goodly part kept faith and violet or else mankind long since had been unutterably cut off and propagation never could have brought the species down to ages less perchance concerning these affairs thou ponderest in silent meditation let me say twas lightning brought from evil league to earth the fire for mortals and from thence hath spread over all the lands the flames of heat for thus even now we see so many objects touched by the celestial flames to flash a glow when thunderbolt has dowered them with heat yet also when a many branched tree beaten by winds writhed swaying to and fro pressing against branches of a neighbor tree thereby the power of mighty rub and rub its fire engendered and at times out flare the scorching heat of flame and balls do chafe against the trunk and of these causes either may well have given to mortal men the fire next food to cook and soften the flame the sun instructed since so oft they saw how objects mellowed when subdued by warmth and by the raining blows of fiery beams through all the fields and more and more each day would men more strong in sense more wise in heart teach them to change their earlier mode in life by fire and new devices Kings began cities to found and citadels to set as strongholds and asylums for themselves, the flocks and fields to portion for each man after the beauty, strength, and sense of each. For beauty then imported much, and strength had its own right supreme. Thereafter wealth discovered was, and gold was brought to light, which soon of honor stripped both strong and fair. For men, however beautiful in form or valor, to follow in the main the rich man's party. Yet were man to steer his life by sounder reasoning, he'd owned abounding riches. If with mind content, he lives by thrift, for never, as I guess, is there a lack of little in the world. But men wish glory for themselves and power, even that their fortunes on foundations firm might rest forever, and that they themselves, the opulent, might pass a quiet life in vain, in vain, since in the strife to climb on to the heights of honor men do make their pathway terrible and even when once they reach them envy like the thunderbolt at times will smite o hurling headlong down from murkiest tartarus in scorn for lo all summits all regions loftier than the rest 
smoke blasted as by in these thunderbolts. So better far and quiet to obey than to desire a chief mastery of affairs and ownership of empires. Be it so, and let the weary sweat their life blood out, all to no end, battling in hate along the narrow path of man's ambition, since all their wisdom is from others' lips, and all they seek is known from what they heard and less from what they thought. Nor is this folly greater today, nor greater soon to be, than twas of old. And therefore kings were slain, and pristine majesty of golden thrones, and haughty scepters lay overturned in dust, and crowns so splendid on the sovereign heads, soon bloody and uneven, solitary and peak, grown for their glories gone, for erst over much dreaded, thereafter with more greedy zest trampled beneath the rabble heel. Thus things down to the vilest the brawling mob succumbed while each man sought unto himself dominion and supremacy. So the next some wiser heads instructed men to found the magisterial office and give frame code that they might consent to follow laws for humankind over weary with a life fostered by force was ailing from its feuds and so the sooner of its own free will yielded to laws and strictest codes for since each hand made ready in its wrath to take a vengeance fiercer than by man's fair laws is now conceded Men on this account loathe the old life fostered by force. Tis thence that fear of punishment defiles each prize of wicked days, for force and fraud ensnare each man around and in the main recoil on him from whence they sprung. Not easy tis for one who violates by ugly deeds the bonds of common peace to pass a life composed and tranquil. For albeit he escaped the race of gods and them, he yet must dread will not be his forever, since indeed so many oft babbling on amid their dreams or raving in sickness have betrayed themselves as stories tell and published at last old secrets in the sun. But nature was urged men to utter various sounds of tongue and need and use to mold the names of things about in the same wise as the lax speech ears can tell young children of their gestures, making them point with finger here and there at what's before them. For each creature feels by instinct to what use to put his powers, for Yet the bull calf's scare begotten horns project above his brows, with them he gins rage to butt and savagely thrust. But whelps of panthers and the lion's cubs with claws and paws and bites are at the fray already, when their teeth and claws be scarce as yet engendered. So again, we see all breeds of winged creatures press to wings and from their fluttering pinions seek to get a fluttering assistance. Thus to think that in those days some man apportioned round to things their names and that from him men learned their first nomenclature is foolery. For why could he mark everything by words and utter the various sounds of tongue? what time the rest may be supposed powerless to do the same. And if the rest had not already won, number one, with other used words, whence was implanted in the teacher, then foreknowledge of their use and whence was given to him alone primordial faculty to know and see in mind, twas he willed, besides one only man could scarce subdue an overmastered multitude to choose to get by heart his names of things. A task not easy to any wise to teach and to persuade the deaf concerning what to needful for to do. For never would they allow for 
nor never in any wise endure perpetual vain ding-dong in their ears of spoken sounds unheard before and what at last is this affair so wondrous is in this affair so wondrous is that the human race and human voice and tongue were now in vigor should by diverse words denote its objects as each diverse sense might prompt since even the speechless herds i since the very generations of wild beasts that are wont dissimilar and diverse sounds to rouse from in them when there is fear or pain and when they burst with joys and this forsooth is thine to know from plainest facts when first huge flabby jowls of mad molossian hounds barring their hard white teeth begin to snarl and threaten with infuriate lips peeled back and sounds far other than with which they bark and fill with voices all the regions round and when with fondling tongue they start to lick their puppies or do toss them round with paws feigning gentle bites to gape and snap they fawn with yelps of voice far other than when then thin than when alone within the house they bay or whimpering slink cringing sides from blows again the name of the horses that not seem to differ likewise when the stud and buoyant flower of his young years raised goaded by a winged glove amongst the mares and when with widening nostrils out he snorts the call to battle and when haply he whinnies at times terror quaking limbs lastly a flying race the dappled birds fox ospreys seagulls searching food and life amid the ocean billows and the brine utter at other times far other cries and when they fight for food or with their prey struggle and strain and birds there are which change with changing weather their own raucous songs as long-lived generations of the crows or flocks of rocks whoops <laughs> when they be said to cry for rain and water and to call at times for winds and gales ergo if diverse moods compel the brutes though speechless evermore to send forth diverse sounds oh truly then how much more likely twere that mortal men in those days could with many a different sound denote each separate thing and now what cause hath spread divinities of gods abroad through mighty nations and filled the cities full of high altars and led to practices of solemn rites and seasons rites which still flourish in midst of great affairs of state and midst great centers of man's civic life the rites went still in poor mortality is grafted that quaking awe which rears aloft still the new temples of gods from land to land and drives mankind to visit them in throngs on holy days Tis not so hard to give reason thereof in speech, because in sooth, even in those days, would the race of man be seeing excellent visages of gods, with mind awake and in his sleeps yet more bodies of wondrous growth, and thus to these would men attribute sense, because they seem to move their limbs and speak pronouncements high, befitting glorious visage and vast powers, and men would give them and eternal life because their visages forevermore were there before them and their shapes remained and chiefly however because men would not think beings augmented with such mighty powers could well by any force overmastered be and men would think them in their happiness excelling far because the fear of death vexed no one of them at all and since at same time in men's sleeps men saw them do so many wonders and yet feel therefrom themselves no weariness besides men marked how in a fixed order rolled around the systems of the sky and changed times of annual seasons nor were men 
nor were able them to know thereof the causes. Therefore it was men would take refuge in consigning all unto divinities, and in feigning all was guided by their nod. And in the sky they set the seats and vault of gods, because across the sky night and the moon are seen to roll along noon, day, and night, and night's old awesome constellations evermore, and the night wandering fireballs of the sky, and flying flames clouds, and the sun, the rain, snow, and the winds, the lightning, and the hail, and the swift rumbling, and the hollow roar of mighty menacing forevermore. O oh, humankind unhappy when it ascribed unto divinity such awesome deeds, and coupled thereto rigors of fierce wrath. What groans did men on that sad day to get even for themselves, and O oh, what wounds for us, what tears for our children's children? Nor, O oh man, is thy true piety in me, with head under the veil still to be seen to turn, fronting a stone, and ever to approach unto all altars, nor so prone on earth forward to fall, to see spread upturned palms before the shrines of God, nor yet to do altars, D -E -W, with Profuse blood of four foot geese, nor vows with vows to link, but rather this to look on all things with a master eye and mind at peace. For when we gaze aloft upon the skyey vault of yon great world of ether, fixed high over twinkling stars, and into our thought then come the journeyings of sun and moon, O oh, then into our breasts, overburdened already with their other ills, begins forthwith to rear its sudden head one more misgiving, lest over us for taste it be the God's immeasurable power that rolls with very motion round and round the far white constellation, to the lack of aught of reasons tried the puzzled mind whether was ever a birth time of the world, and whether likewise any end shall be, how far the ramparts of the world can still outstand the strain of ever roused motion, or whether divinely with the eternal wheel endowed they can through endless tracts of age glide on, defying the over mighty powers of the immeasurable ages. Lo, what man is there whose mind with dread of God's cringes not close, whose limbs with terror spell crouch not together when the parched earth quakes with the horrible thunderbird amain, and across the mighty sky the rumblings run? Do not the peoples and the nations shake, and haughty kings, do they not hug their limbs, stroop through with Struck through with fear, with fear of the divinities, lest for aught folly done or madly said, a heavy time be now at hand to pay. When two fierce force of fury winds at sea sweepeth the navy's admiral down the main with his stout legions and his elephants, doth not, doth he not? Seek the peace of God with vows, and beg in prayer a tremble, bold winds, and friendly gales. In vain, since often up caught in fury cyclones, is he borne along, for all his mouthings to the shoals of doom. Ah, so irrecoverably some hidden power betramples forever more affairs of men. And visibly grindeth with its heel and mire the lictor's glorious rods and axes dire, having them in derision, 
again when earth from end to end is rocking underfoot and shaking the city's ruin down or threatened upon the verge what wonder is it then that mortal generations abase themselves and unto gods and all affairs of earth assign at last resort almighty powers and wondrous energy to govern all now for the rest copper and gold and iron discovered were and with them silver weight and power of lead when with prodigious heat the conflagrations burn the forest trees among the mighty mountains by a bolt of lightning from the sky or else because men warring in the woodlands and their foes had hurled fire to frighten and dismay or yet because by goodness of the soil invited men desired to clear rich fields and turn the country sides to pasture lands or stay the wild and thrive upon the spoils for hunting by pitfall and by fire aroused before the art of hedging the covert round with net or stirring it with dogs to chase how so the fact and from what cause soever the flaming heat with awful crack and roar had there devoured to their deepest roots the forest trees and baked the earth with fire then from the boiling veins began to ooze o oh, rivulets of silver and of gold of lead and copper too collecting soon into the hollow places of the ground and when men saw the cool lumps and not to shine with splendor sheen upon the ground much taken with that lustrous smooth delight then began to pry them out and saw how each had got a shape like to his earthly mold then would it enter their heads how these same lumps if melted by heat could into any form or figure of things be run and how again if hammered out they could be nicely drawn to the sharpest point or finest edge and thus yield to the forger's tools and give them power to chop the forest down to hew the logs to shave the beams and plank besides to bore and punch and drill and then began such work as first as much with tools of silver and gold as with the impetuous strength of the stout copper but vainly since their overmastered power would soon give way unable to endure like copper with such hard labor in those days copper it was that uh, was the thing of price and gold lay useless blunted with dull edge now lies the copper low and gold hath, gold hath come unto the loftiest honors thus it is that rolling ages change the times of things what erst was of a price becomes at last a discard of no honor whilst another succeeds to glory issuing from contempt and day by day is sought for more and more and when tis found the flower and men's praise object of wondrous honor now men yes how nature of iron discovered was thou mayest of thine own self divine men's ancient arms were hands and nails and teeth stones too and bows breakage of forest trees and flame and fire as soon as known Thereafter force of iron and copper discovered was, and copper's use was known before iron. Since more tractable its nature is, and its abundance more. With copper men to work the soil began, with copper to rouse the hurry waves of war, to straw the monstrous wounds and seize away another flock and field another flock and field for unto them thus armed all things naked of defence readily yielded 
Then by slow degrees, the sword of iron succeeded, and the shape of brazen sickle into its form was turned. The iron to cleave the soil of earth, they began, and of earth they began, and the contentions of uncertain war were rendered equal. And lo, man was wont on to mount upon the ribs of Horus and guide him with the rein and play about with right hand free of times before he tried perils of war and yoked chariot and yoked pairs of breasts came earlier than yoked before or scattered chariots wherein two combed the men's men at arms and next the punic folk did train the elephants those cursed lucan again oxen hideous the serpent handed with turrets on their bulks to endure the war, wounds of war and panic strike the mighty troops of mars thus discord sad begat the one thing after another to be the terror of the nations under arms and day by day to horrors of old war she added an increase in wars uh, bulls too they tried in war's grim business and essayed to send outrageous boars against the foes and some sent on before their ranks who sent lions with armed trainers and with master spirits to guide and hold in chains and yet in vain since flushed with pell-mell slaughter fierce they flew and blindly through the squadrons havoc wrought shaking the frightful crests upon their heads now here now there nor could the horsemen calm their horses panic rested at the roar and rein them round to front the foe with spring the infuriate she lions would upleap now here now there and whoso came apace against them these did rend across the face, and others unwitting from behind did tear down from their mounts, and twining round them, bring tumbling to earth, overmastered by the wound, and with those powerful fangs and hooked claws fastened upon them, bulls would toss their friends and trample underfoot, and from beneath rip flanks and bellies of horses with their horns and with a threatening forehead jam the sod and boars with gore with stout tusk their allies splashing in fury their own blood on spears splintered in their own body and with fell and rout and ruin infantry and horse for there the beasts of saddle tried to escape the savage thrusts of tusk by shying off or rearing up with hooves of paw and air in vain since there thou mightest see them sink their sinews severed and with heavy fall bestrew the ground and such of these as men suppose well trained long ago at home were in the thick of action seemed to foam in fury from the wounds the shrieks the flight the panic and the tumult nor could men aught of their numbers rally for each breed and various of the wild beasts fled apart hither or thither as often wars today flee those Lucian oxen by the steel grievously mangled after they have wrought upon their friends so many a dreadful doom if twas indeed that thus they did it all but scarcely all believe that men could not with mind foreknow and see as sure to come such foul and general disaster this we then may hold as true in the great all in diverse worlds on diverse plan create somewhere far more likely than upon one certain earth but men choose this to do less in the hope of conquering than to give their enemies a goodly cause of woe even though thereby they perish themselves since weakened numbers and since wanting arms now close of roughly interplated strands were earlier than loom wove covering the loom wove later than man iron is since iron is needful in the weaving art nor by no other 
means can there be wrought such polished tools the treadles, spindles, shuttles, and sounding yarn beams, and nature forced the men before the womankind to work the wool. For all the male kind far excels in skill and clever is by much, until at last the rug farmer folk jeered at such tasks, and so were eager soon to give them over to woman's hands and in more hardy toil to harden arms and hands. But nature herself, mother of things, was the first seed sower and primal grafter, since the berries and acorns dropping from off the trees would there beneath put forth in season swarms of little shoots. Hence, too, men's fondness for engrafting slips upon the boughs and setting out and hold the young shrubs over the fields. Then would they try ever new modes of sowing their love crop and mark they would how earth improves the taste of the wild fruits by fond and fostering care and day by day they'd force the woods to move still higher up the mountain and to yield um, and to yield the place below for tilth that there might that there they might on plains and uplands have their meadow plots cisterns and runnels crops of standing grain and happy vineyards and that all along over hillocks, intervales, and plains might run the silvery green belt of olive trees, marking the plotted landscape, even as now the sea is so marked with varied loveliness, all the terrain which men adorn and plant with rows of goodly fruit trees and hedge round with thriving shrubberies sown. But by the mouth, to imitate the liquid notes of birds was earlier far amongst men and in power to make a measured song, melodious verse, and give delight to ears. And whistlings of the wind all through the hollows of the reeds first taught the peasantry to blow into the stalks of hollow hemlock herbs. Then, bit by bit, they learned sweet plaining, such as pipe outpours, beaten by fingertips of singing men, when heard through untabbed groves and forest deeps and woodsy meadows through the untrod haunts of shepherd folk and spots divinely still. Thus time draws forward each and everything, little by little, unto the midst of men, and reason uplifts it to the shores of life. These tunes would soothe and glad the minds of mortals when sated with food, for songs are welcome then. And often, lounging with friends in the soft grass beside a river of water, underneath a big tree's branches, merrily they'd refresh their frames with no vast outlay. Most of all, if the weather were smiling and the times of the year were painting the green of the grass around with flowers, then jokes, then talk, then peals of jollity would circle round. For then the rustic muse was in her glory, then would antic mirth prompt them to garland head and shoulders about with chaplets of intertwined flowers and leaves, and to dance onward out of tune, limbs clownishly swaying and with clownish foot to beat our mother earth, from whence arose laughter and peals of jollity. For lo, such frolic acts were in their glory then, being more new than strange. And wakeful men found solaces for their unsleeping hours in drawing forth variety of notes, in modulating melodies, and running with puckered lips along the tune reads, whence even in our day do the watchmen guard these old traditions and have learned well to keep true measure, and yet they no whit do get the larger fruit of gladsomeness, and got the woodland aborigines in olden times. For what we have at hand, if therefore not sweeter we have known, that chiefly pleases and seems best of all. But then some later, likely better, find, destroys its worth and changes our desires regarding good of yesterday.
and thus began the loathing of the acorn. Thus abandoned were those beds with grasses streaming with the leaves laden. Thus again fell into new contempt the pelts of these erstwhile a robe of honor, which I guess aroused in those days envy so malign that the first wearer went to woeful death by ambuscades. And yet that hairy prize rent into rags by greedy foemen there, and the splash by blood was ruined utterly beyond all use or vantage. Thus of old was pelts, and of today tis purple and gold that cart men's lives with cares and weary with war. Wherefore, methinks, besides the greater blame with us vain men today, for coal would rack without their pelts the naked sons of earth, but us it nothing hurts to do without the purple vestment broidered with gold and with imposing figures if we still make shift with some mean garment of the plebs so man in vain futilities toils on forever and wastes in idle cares his years because of very truth he hath not learnt what the true end of getting is nor yet at all how far true pleasure may increase and it's his desire for better and for more hath carried by degrees mortality out onward to the deep and roused up from the far bottom mighty waves of war but sun and moon those watchmen of the world with their own lanterns traversing around the mighty the revolving vault of thought unto mankind that seasons of the years return again and that thing takes place after a fixed plan of order fixed already where they pass their life edged round by a strong tower and cultivate an earth all portion out and boundary already with the sea flower with sail winged ships already men had under treaty pact confederates and allies when poets began to hand heroic actions down in verse nor long before this had letters been devised hence we are age unable to look back on what has gone before except where reason shows us a footprint sailings on the seas tillings of fields walls laws and arms and roads dress and the like all prizes all delights of finer life poems pictures chiseled shapes of polished sculptures all these arts were learned by practice and the mind's experience as men walk forward step by eager step Thus time draws forward each and everything little by little into the midst of men, and reason uplifts it to the shores of light. For one thing after other did men see, grow clear by intellect, till with their arts they've now achieved the supreme pinnacle.